Pleasant Sabbath Church. It's a pleasure to have everyone back here um, for a continuation of our um, revival service. Or yeah. Um, before we start, can we all stand as we open with a word of prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this opportunity that you've given each and every one of us to bring us back here to continue in worship to you, dear God. We pray that today as we open with song that you would be in our midst and that you would accept our worship in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Our um, opening song will be hymn number 258, Baptize Us in You. stand for our theme song and revive us again.
Good evening, everyone. Please be seated. Did you enjoy the Sabbath today? Amen. Amen. Welcome again. This is our second session of the uh, uh, Community Outreach Series this week with evangelist and international speaker, Pastor Jeremiah Davis. Please uh, bow your heads and join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the day that we have enjoyed today with each other and most importantly with you. We praise you, Lord, for what you have revealed to us today in your word. We thank you for the fellowship this afternoon. And as we continue worshiping together, fellowshipping together this evening, we look forward to what you have in store for us this evening. Father, may you fill this place with your Holy Spirit to be with the speaker Give him the word to speak. May he decrease, for you must increase. May you be with individuals who are here tonight, Father, who are here perhaps for the first time. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hello, everyone. We had a good time this morning. And I know that uh, many of you were here. Was there any first time visitor to our church here this morning? Any first time visitor? Okay, okay. Um, but I, I think you're with, um, well, yes, you are first time visitor. But I think you're with, with, with our guests. So I don't think you're really well, what I'm saying is this. I want to give some gifts out, right? I have a lot of gifts, and, and I want to give some gifts out. So it, I need to give um, gifts to um, someone that is not yet baptized. Are you baptized? Well, that's why I say you don't. You, don't, you, you can't, but not what I'm looking for, right? Okay. So, um, let me see the hands of all those people bring 10 people as guests this evening. Anyone who bring 10, 10 people as guests? 10 people? Okay. I remember, remember, I said 15, but I would circle at 10, right? So, okay, I would will, I will have to keep, I'm sorry, I have to keep my gift. I can't give it for less than 10 people. I'm sorry. Maybe later on, but for now, 10 people is the max. All right? Okay. All right. Am I fair? All right. Good, good. It's a special gift, I'm telling you. So, I cannot just give it for less than 10 people. All right. Um, for those, for the, the, the first time uh, visitors, this, there is no first time visitor here. Okay, there is one. On, okay, um, brother, could you help me? Um, I have some. I have lots of uh, gifts here. So, give uh, my friend there. What's your name? Caleb. Caleb. Caleb is our first time visitor to our church. Give him a gift, please. All right. Now, I also have some questions. Remember I told you that you were supposed to write down what the preacher is saying. Let me see all the hands that did that. Okay, 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 great, great. Oh, I, I, love, I love my people, man. They're so obedient, you know? I love you guys, I love you guys. Now, the trivia question that I have today is... From, from Hebrew 10, 24 to 25, why does Paul exalt us to not forsake the assembling together? Question, why does Paul in Hebrew 10, 25 to 24 to 25, why does Paul exalt us not to forsake 
are assembling together. Anyone has the answer? Yes, there's a hand there. Okay, well, I'll, I'll give you it. Not, not quite what I'm looking for, but, but anyone else? Okay. Okay. Okay, that's, that's not what I'm looking for. Yes, there's another hand. That's, that's the correct one. As we see the day approaching, we should not forsake the assembly of ourselves. Okay, so give her a gift. Um, the acronym, acronym CPI, what does that stand for? CIP, yeah. What? So everybody knows that one. So that's that's disqualifier. I'm sorry. Every, everyone gets a gift. What what do you say, man? So, so I, I'm generous, but he's not, and he has the books. So okay, all right, all right, okay. So the next question is this. In, in what year was the popular science article and limits of growth published? Okay. 72? <laughs> any, any one of our visitors knows, know that one? 72. My, 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 my visitor, don't about get a, a, a gift. Okay. So, you know what? I will, do, I will do better questions tomorrow. Okay? Because I, I'm, I'm, I'm very generous, but I don't think I'm that generous to have the answer right before. So, I'm not that generous. So, I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. So, Next, I'm, I promise you tomorrow, my questions will be hard. So you need to, to write things down, okay? Write things down because I really have a lot of gifts and I want to give them out. I don't want to keep them, so I want to give them out, but I, I can't be too generous, right? Okay, God bless you all and see you tomorrow again. Good evening, everyone. I have a quick health nugget to share with you, and I hope as we go through this, um, you will get, gain some benefits from this. So what I have is, I'll just back that up, 10 clever things to know about your breathing. Number one. Your breath responds first in your body. Your breath will respond and adjust according to what you're thinking, feeling, observing, hearing, tasting, touching, sensing, or experiencing at the time. It is intimately connected to your physical and emotional state. Where do you normally breathe from? It's a good question. That's a good answer back there. That's what we should be doing, yes. Do you use your chest? 
when you're not um, engaging in physical activities or from the diaphragm. And somebody said the diaphragm. You, one, of the reason, one of the ways you can, you can identify that is when you're breathing, sometimes you just feel the air go here and no further. But what you can do is rest your arms or your hands just at the lower ribs and breathe and you will feel the expansion there. Don't hold your breath. This is something that we do a lot. When we're concentrating, we tend to hold our breath. And that causes our breathing to become more rapid in order to compensate. And this sets us up for a habit of erratic breathing. And that is definitely not good for our overall health. Did you know 70% of waste, body waste, is eliminated through your breathing? The rest is through the urine, the skin, and feces. When the efficiency of your lungs is reduced due to poor breathing, less oxygen is available to our cells. It slows the flow of blood, which carries waste from the kidneys and lungs, or lymphatic our lymphatic system, which fights off viral and bacterial invaders, is weakened, and this also slows the digestive process. Jerky, shallow, fast, constricted, or tight breathing reflects that you live your days in a constant stress state. You tend to overreact to what's happening around you. Your days are rushed, and time is always an issue. If you improve your breathing habits, then you will find that the experience, your breathing experience, will become more steady. And just a reminder there to remember to relax. Quality breathing can help to release fear, anger, and sadness. When you're experiencing stressful emotions, the body's natural response is to become tense. So focus on physically relaxing. Nose breathe quietly, and you will feel yourself regaining control, quieting those extreme emotions. Your nose is not, your, it is for breathing, <laughs> and your mouth for eating. Breathe in and out through your nose. Nose breathing helps to correct any imbalance of oxygen and dioxide in the blood. Your breath activates your nervous system. When the sympathetic sympathetic nervous system is activated, you are living life with the accelerator on full throttle all the time. You're in fight or flight mode and constantly releasing the stress hormones into your body. On the other hand, the parasympathetic nervous system helps to slow your body down, which in turn allows restoration and rejuvenation. The key to activating your parasympathetic nervous system is to place your full attention onto your breath. One way you can do that is to close your eyes and allow your breath to slow down, relax, and become gentle. Let your whole body absorb the now gentle breath and rest in that time. And you'll experience the pause after you exhale. Notice the very natural stillness and slight pause after each exhale. If you do that, you will be infusing that gentleness into your breathing. 
become present, there is a pocket of peace to be found in that pause. And finally, your body can't relax if your mind and breath are racing. Your thoughts are directly linked to the quality of your breathing. Busy, overactive thinking often short, means short, shallow, and quick breaths. By focusing on calming your mind, you will automatically be calming your breath and in turn, relaxing your body. I hope you found a little bit of, or some benefit, great benefits in that. The, our help ministries team will be sharing each evening, just a short nugget with you, and we hope you will be blessed through them. Thank you. Amen. Once again, welcome and good evening to all. Um, so this evening, um, we once again come together before God to worship Him in song and prayer and the hearing and reading of His Word. But did you know that tithing and free will offerings are also considered a form of worship as gratitude to God for all His blessings? The offerings that we bring tonight go towards the spreading of the word of God and the gospel message of salvation given during these evangelistic series. Everything we have and everything we are, we receive from God. Let us tonight give something back to him, uh, uh, to him that gave his life for us. In Psalm uh, 50, uh, 96, sorry, 7 to 8, we read, Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. So in the pews in front of you, if you would like, you, uh, you will find offering envelopes. You can use those if you like. Um, so in, in those you can place your name, um, and, um, um, and, and your information, and uh, mark under the category other. You will see that at the bottom uh, for evangelistic series. So mark it that it's for evangelistic series so that um, they will know, the treasurer will know that's what it's going for. So I will ask at this time for the ushers to come forward. And we'll bow our heads for prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we come with gratitude in our hearts. For you are a wonderful and awesome God. You are the master of the universe. Everything we see and that which we cannot see, your hand has made. And yet, Lord, you look upon us, sinful human beings, with pity, with mercy, and great love. We thank you for that, dear Lord. And now we ask that this offering that we are about to collect, that it um, may bring great results for your kingdom and that your kingdom can be enlarged. This is our humble prayer in the precious and mighty name of Jesus, who died that we can live and live forever. Amen.
little stand for our theme song. And this time we're going to be doing the last two stanzas of the song. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you're such a wonderful God, and that you love us with an infinite love that cannot cease. And we pray, Lord, that as we gather here together, that you will revive us with your spirit. For we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Uh, you may be seated. I'm going to put this to the side. Please forgive me. I want to thank and welcome everyone that is here tonight, and I believe that God is getting ready to do something that has never been done in this area because I believe the time demands it. Jesus is getting ready to come. This is not an accident. This is not that you just happen to come and be here. It is because God in his love and mercy is trying to save each and every one of us because he loves us with an everlasting love. What a wonderful God. Amen. I want to say something tonight that I'm going to pretty much ask every night because I understand how God works, but also how the devil works. Was it hard for you to get here tonight? And you told me, no, not tonight. Well, I'm going to tell you before it's over with, it's going to be hard for you to get here. I promise you that the devil is afraid of these meetings more than you and I are afraid of these meetings. The devil understands that his entire kingdom is dependent upon trying to stop you and I from getting a relationship with Jesus Christ. Satan's afraid. Every demon in hell that he could uh, 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 spare, in fact, he even borrowed some and sent them to bury Seventh-day Adventist Church and bury this entire area because he's afraid. He understands the power of Jesus Christ. He understands the power of the Word of God. It has nothing to do with a man. It has everything to do with Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. The devil's afraid that if you and I take what we're going to study this week serious, we will cause his kingdom to be destroyed. You know, there's enough people in this room that can reach the entire world. I didn't say the entire Canada. I didn't say that. There's enough people in this room that can actually reach the entire world. Can you imagine 12 men without internet? Without airplane, without train, without automobile, 12 men were able to reach the entire world. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have the ability to live stream and do what we're doing now. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, they were able to reach the entire world. And do you know we're told that the gospel will not close with less power than it started. But we need the reviving of his spirit. And so the devil's afraid of what's getting ready to happen. But my brothers and sisters, I think he should be afraid because if anyone you should fear, you should fear Jesus. The Bible says the devils fear and tremble. And so tonight we're going to continue in our series, Wake Up, for time is running out. Now that's not really the right slide, but I'm going to take that slide. It's okay, we'll take that one, we'll take it. Satan's afraid of something. 
Now, my question is, what is the devil afraid of? You think he's afraid of something? He is. Let's see what he's afraid of. Inspiration tells us in Selected Messages, Book 1, Father, anoint your words. We have opened it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's read this together. It says, there is what? Nothing that Satan fears so much as that the people of God shall clear the way by removing not some hindrances, but how much? Every hindrance. So that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church. What does languish mean? Dying. Dead. You know, when you revive something, it's because it's dying or dead. It says, to pour out his spirit upon a languishing church and an impenitent congregation. If Satan had his way, but I praise God, the devil won't have his way. But if Satan had his way, there would never be another awakening. What's the next two words? Great or small? You know that even the smallest revival Satan's afraid of. To the end of time. But we are not ignorant of his devices. In other words, Satan is afraid of a revival. We're told that the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs is a revival and a reformation. And to seek this should be our first work. And that's what we're doing tonight, seeking for this revival. Now, in order to get this revival, we need Jesus. What do you say? In fact, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Chronicles. I want to look at something before we stop and pray and really get into our study this evening. I pray that every night you will bring pen and paper. What did I say? Pen and paper. Every night. Every night you want to bring pen and paper. Why? So that you can take notes. Every night you want to make sure that you bring Bibles. What did I say? Bring what? In fact, if you have your Bibles, let me see your Bibles. I want to make sure that you have a Bible. Now, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a break tonight. But a Bible, I'm going to tell you something about a Bible that's different. Whenever you can cut the power off, then what you have is not a Bible. I'm going to say it again. If whatever you have, you call a Bible, you can somehow cut the power off, it's not a Bible. Now, if you're in the backwoods somewhere and that's all you have, I say, praise God, use what you got. Amen. Use what you have. But my brothers and sisters, God has made it possible. I'm going to tell you something. We're going before it's over. Do you know that there's a difference? Do you know that if Martin Luther had stood up with some of the things that we have today, he would have been cast to the flame somewhere. Do you know that there's something about this book? There's something about this book when you open its pages. Do you know that this is the greatest book in the universe? This book is greater than all books combined together. This is the greatest book in the entire universe, and the devil does not want us to get back into this book. And so by God's grace, if you don't have one tonight, you have a, you have a, a, a free break. You, this is a slide. I'm giving you one night free. Amen? In fact, today I was a little bit lean on you because I knew that we were introducing ourselves to each other. You know, you don't want to, when you introduce yourself to somebody, you, you want to introduce yourself right. Am I right? But I believe that when God opened, that, that when we open up the word of God, I believe that God's presence is here. Do you believe that? And I believe that we have lost a sense of what it means to be in God's presence. You know, over the sanctuary when it says reverence, God's house. Do you know that, that our cell phones should not be going off if we knew we're in God's presence? We shouldn't be getting up, you know, somebody would actually pick up a cell phone inside of church. Now, now, do you think that God is going to call you while you're in church? God's not calling you. I can promise you that. My brothers and sisters, we should be able to turn those things off or at best or at least put it on silent so it does not disturb the spirits moving. I believe that God is real, brothers and sisters. I believe that if we come into his presence, the Bible says the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all of the earth keep silence. Do you know that we do too much talking? When we come into God's presence, this is not a time for you and I to be holding on conversations with each other. Now, you have all of Barry. You can go out there as much as you want and Barry and talk as loud as you want. But in this room, we should be respecting the presence of Jesus. And I don't care if the man's on the balcony. I don't care if he's up front or on the outside. As long as he's in this presence, God holds the minister responsible for the order of his service. And I'm not going to be derelict of my duty. I believe that if God deserves respect in me, we go to courtrooms. And do you know that they won't let you take a, a cell phone into the courtroom? They will make you put that cell phone out into the courtroom because of the presence of the judge, the esteemed uh, uh, person who sits as a judge or a minister of the, uh, the judicial system. But here, the great judge of all the universe, we give more respect to man than we do to God. Something's wrong with us. 
but I'm so glad that God is merciful. What do you say? And so if you have a cell phone, you can take this opportunity to cut it off, to put it on silent. We don't want anything to disturb the speaking and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, brothers and sisters, we're going to First Chronicles. What book did I say? We're going to First Chronicles 12. Now, we were doing something earlier today. We laid out a foundation. We found out something. Earlier today, we found out that something happened not long ago that was called the beginning of the end. The beginning of the what? And you remember that I gave you a date that we saw in history that began to talk to us about the beginning of the end. Can anybody quickly in review tell me what was the date that we looked at from the Bible in history that helped us to identify quickly the beginning of the end? What was that date? If I can have somebody come up quickly. I look like this, the legs may get ready to fall on me in the back. Might want to stiffen that leg up there. Yes. Now, what was that year that, that, that we said? What was the year that we said? Uh, the beginning of the end. Not the time of the end, but the beginning of the end. We looked at Matthew 24. Jesus talked about signs that would lead up to his coming. Remember that? He said that, that, that when you see, he talked about these things, that when, they, when they asked him the question, what should be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And Jesus began to start giving signs. Then Jesus talked about a war. He talked about a pandemic. He talked about a worldwide disease. We looked at that from the Bible. Now, my brothers and sisters, what year did we attach in a special sense to this beginning of the end? What year do we attach? 2020. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is not an accidental date. God gave us the events. And as we look at the events, we are to put dates on them. As we look at history and prophecy, we'll be able to identify where we are. In fact, we're going to find that, 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 that we found that in understanding this, that God had a three-step plan because if 2020 marked the beginning of the end and 2030 was a time that history, and we're going to come back to this, show the crisis developing in the world, we found that if that's not so far away that the greatest thing that we need is a relationship with God. And I heard someone say CPI, but we want a CIP, Amen. That relationship with God, it is a CIP. What does the CIP stand for? Close, intimate, and what? Personal. I want you to remember that. Every day, I'm going to make sure that we remind ourselves and review this because this is the greatest thing we need. If we only have a little time left, the greatest thing we need is a relationship with God that is not far away, but that is close. That is not casual, but that is intimate. That's not in a group, but that's personal. We need this personal relationship with Jesus. It is a CIP. What does the C stand for? Close. What does the I stand for? Intimate. What does the P stand for? Personal. Now, this morning, we laid the first principle down of how to get that type of relationship with Jesus. We're going to be studying this week and understand this. We're going to make it as simple as possible by the grace of God. But we laid down a principle, the first great principle, if we want this type of relationship with Christ that is close and intimate and personal, and you can say it in three words. Does anybody remember what it was? Sister. Praise God. What was that word? It what? It takes time. So what if I say I have no time for God? What is that telling me? I have no time to develop this relationship with Jesus. I don't care who a man is or what the person is to develop a relationship with anybody. It takes time. And what we're studying here tonight, which is so important, is because time is running out. Now, I want to introduce tonight a three-step plan in getting to know God. A what? A three-step plan in getting to know God. You know, it's amazing. The devil sometimes has three-step plans. Sometimes you're, you're, you're addicted to some things and they give you, uh, also in the world, a three-step plan. You go to an alcoholic anonymous class and you're trying to get out of alcohol or addiction, drug abuse. So they sometimes give you plans. You know, the Bible gives us a three-step plan of how to get to know Jesus. Do you want to know him? Yes. Go to First Chronicles. What book did I say? First Chronicles chapter 12. Now, I'm going to tell us this first because once we see... How close we are to this crisis, we're going to need an experience with Jesus that will be able to allow us to avert any fear. You see, if we don't know Jesus, we should be afraid of what's coming. But if we know Jesus, there's nothing to be afraid of. 
You see, the problem is you and I don't have this experience with Jesus yet, but God is telling us that I want you to have this experience with me. And so the Bible says in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 1 Chronicles chapter 12, and we want to begin in verse 32. Let's read that together. 1 Chronicles chapter 12, beginning in verse 32. What does the Bible say in verse 32? Let's read that together. The Bible says, and the children of... Now, does anybody know who the children of Issachar were? Anybody know who Issachar was? Issachar was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob had 12 sons. Remember, those sons were divided up into tribes. Now, that is not just an ordinary tribe. In fact, and you go to the book of Revelation, you'll find in the last days that the tribe of Issachar are among the people that are sealed in the last days, showing us characteristics that we need to have at the end of time. Now, notice what it says in 1 Chronicles 12. It says, and the children of Issachar, which were men that had, what's the first thing? Understanding of the times. We're going to find that, number one, if we're going to get to know God, one of the first things that God is going to help us to understand is that we must know and what? Understand the time. The Bible doesn't say be confused about the times. The Bible says in verse 32, and the children of Israel were men that had understanding of the times. Now, why did they understand the time according to the text? It goes on to say, they were men that had understanding of the time to know what Israel ought to do. So the first step is that we must know and understand the time. What is the second step? Why does God want us to know and understand the time? Why does God want us to know and understand the time? To know what to do. Now, is there a relationship between understanding time and knowing what to do? Is there a relationship between the two? Do you know that time regulates everything that we do? Now, think about this for a moment. If a man was going to work and he goes to work and his job is starts at 9 o'clock, does he get up at 12 midnight and begin to dress and go to work? Is it because he doesn't like his job? Maybe not. But that's not why. It's because it's not what? It's not time. You see, brothers and sisters, timing regulates everything we do. Now, how many people were here last night at 10 o'clock for the meetings of this series? None of us. Why? Because it was not time. Do you know that time regulates when we go to work and when we don't go to work, when we go to school and when we don't go to school. It regulates what we eat and when we don't eat. Think about it for a moment. Last night at midnight, what were you eating? Now, I hope you tell me nothing. Amen. Or else we have to tell the health nugget to talk about that. You know, <laughs> at midnight, we should not be having midnight snacks. Amen. So now, my brothers and sisters, the reason why is because it's not time to eat. But do you know, brothers and sisters, there's a time to eat and there's a time not to eat. There's a time to every purpose under heaven. The Bible tells us that everything is regulated by time. You know that the day of worship is regulated by time. That everything we do in life is regulated by time. And this is why that the seven Adventist people are called a people of time because the Bible teaches us that time regulates everything that we do. Now, my brothers and sisters, if we know and understand the time, then we can know what to do in the time. Now, somebody says, well, that tells me about time and knowing what to do, but that doesn't tell me about getting to know God. But look what the Bible says in John 15. What book did I say? You're going to the Gospel of John in the New Testament, John 15. And notice now this three-step plan. First step, we must know and understand the time. I didn't hear you. Now, you're going to find out very early that we're getting ready to begin not just a preaching session, but we're getting ready to begin a school. We're going to begin studying just like you do in school. And at school, when a teacher asks a question, guess what the teacher wants? The teacher wants an answer. <laughs> and if you don't give me an answer, then I might have to take off a belt and give you some corporal punishment. You say, well, in Canada, we don't do that. <laughs> now, of course, I wouldn't do that to you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but what I'm telling us is that by the grace of God, we want to understand. We want to begin to study together and feel comfortable as we study together. We're going to be studying the Bible because in order to understand where we are, we've got to study like we've never studied before. And so we're going to start studying the Bible. So don't be afraid to talk to me. I want to hear your voice. Now, question. First was we must know and understand the time. Second, we must know what to do. 
But what's the third thing? Go to John 15. What book did I say? You're going to John the 15th chapter. And notice what the Bible says in John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And we want to look what the Bible says beginning in verse 14. John 15 and verse 14. Are you there? Amen. Now notice what the Bible says. John 15 verse 14. Let's read that together. The Bible says, you are my friends. Who's talking? Jesus. Jesus said, you are my friends no matter what you do. What's the very next word? What's the very next word? If. Now I want to ask you a question. If. What does if suggest? Condition. Condition. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. Now if anybody knows how to become the friend of Jesus, I think Jesus knows. What do you say? Now my brothers and sisters, do you know that God's love for us is unconditional? God's love for every person in the world is unconditional. You know, it doesn't matter how much sin we commit. I don't care what we do to God. God loves us and will never stop loving us. You know, the man could slap God in the face and his love won't stop. We can spit on him. His love won't stop. We can nail him to a cross and his love will say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What love is this? God loves us with an everlasting love. His love is unconditional. Do you know that the man who, do you know that, that Lucifer who became Satan, do you know that God still loves Satan? And that when Satan is burning in hell fire, that God will cry, Lucifer, Lucifer, how have you fallen? God loves us and nothing we can do can change that. But now, friendship with God is conditional. Love, unconditional. Friendship, conditional. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that God will love us? But even a man that God loves can be lost in hellfire. God loves Satan, but he's lost. God loves the sinner, but a sinner can be lost. It's because the relationship that saves us is conditional. It's a mutual relationship. It's a friendship between God and man. And God will not force us to become his friends. That's love. I mean, can you imagine? Here's a man who has a wife. And he's so longing for her love that he grabs her and says, kiss me, kiss me, kiss me. Should he like that? And say, oh, bragging around, my wife kissed me. Or you forced her to kiss you. That's not love. You know, love is displayed when you don't have to respond to the one that you love. That you choose to say, I will kiss or not kiss. I will say I love or not love. I will hug or not love. And God loves when we, his creatures, would give him our time. Not because he forces us, but because we love him. Friendship is conditional. Now, the Bible says in John 15, verse 14, It says, you are my friends, what's the next word? If ye do whatsoever I want, command you. So the third thing says that we become his friends if we do by God's grace what he says. Now, my brothers and sisters, notice the three-step plan. Now, if I do not do what Christ has given me the power to do to become his friend, can I be his friend, yes or no? He said, if you don't do what I've asked you to do, you cannot be my friend. But how will we know what to do? The Bible says if we understand the time, we will know what to do. And if we do what God says by his grace, we can become his friend. Did you notice the three-step plan? And so Satan's plan is to stop us from becoming God's friend. And in order to stop us from becoming God's friend, all he has to do is set in motion one thing. You see, what we're doing now is showing why do we spend so much time studying time? Why do we spend so much time studying time? Because in order to get to know God, it takes time. And when we understand the time, we know what to do. And if we do it by God's grace, we can become his friends. We're going to show you this week that there's going to have to be some radical changes in order to get to become the close friend of God. What type of changes? Radical. And guess what type of love it's going to take to make those type of radical changes? Guess what type of love it's going to take? Radical love. In order to make a radical change, it's going to take radical love. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do you know that if we love God, we'll be willing to do whatever he says? And so God is trying to right now, while we still have opportunity, tell us it's time to get to know me. 
And one of the first steps, what sets it all in motion? If I want to become God's friend, what sets all of this in motion? What's the first thing that sets it all in motion? Which one of the three sets them all in motion? Talk to me, somebody. Step number one. What's step number one? Understanding the... Because see, the moment I understand the time, I know what to do. And when I do it by God's grace, I can become his friend. And so the first step is that we must understand the time. And that's our quest for the next couple of days. We want to get a better understanding of the time. And what we found out was that God told us something about a time. Remember this report? It says, 40 years after its initial publication, a study called Limits to Grove is looking depressingly prescient. This 1972 report found that if civilization continue in its path toward increasing consumption, that the global economy will collapse by what year? By what year? 2030. Now, these are dates that I want you to put in your mind. I want you to put these dates in your mind, 2030. Write it down. It says population losses would ensue and things would generally begin to fall apart. We looked at this. Now, we found out that it would not wait until 2030. We found out that the crisis would actually start before 2030 and it would just get deeper and deeper. When did we find the crisis would start? I hear one class over here. I hear one student in the class over here. I want to hear all the rest of the students. When did we say it was going to start? What year? 2020. All right. Now, my brothers and sisters, now watch what this says now. This says, in fact, 2020 is the first milestone envisioned by World One. That's when the quality of life is supposed to drop dramatically. And around 2020, the condition of the planet becomes highly critical. If we do nothing about it, the quality of life goes down to zero. Pollution becomes so serious that it will start to kill people, which in turn will cause the population to diminish lower than it was in what year? 1900. And you remember the day that we found out in review? We found out that today, what was the population in 1900? 1.6 billion people. That meant that there would have to be a wipeout of over 7 billion people in order to reduce it to this level. And somebody says, could that ever take place? I'm going to show you by God's grace that the Bible tells us we're going to see worse than that. I'm going to show you this. Now, my brothers and sisters, 2024 is no ordinary year. Now, 2020 was the beginning of the end, but you and I are not now in 2020. 2020 is no longer prophecy. 2020 to us is now history. It's what? So what we're going to do, we're going to begin going through the Bible and start tracing prophecy and history. And we're going to be able to find where 2020 fit, but you and I are not in there. You and I are somewhere in between 2020 and 2030. We're at 2024, and we need to find out what does that mean from a biblical standpoint? What does that mean from the Bible? We're going to find out, brothers and sisters, that when no matter which way you turn, we're going to pass on this. We'll come back to this. Look at what this says here. I want to read this one. This says, why the fall of the American empire will come by what year? Now, I want, to understand, I want you to understand what we're doing. Now, if you were in the court and a lawyer was laying down a case, in order to prove his case, he doesn't just say this person is guilty and everybody, everybody says, okay, they're guilty. And then that's how the courtroom goes. He has to lay down what? What does he have to lay down? Evidence. Evidence. So now, if I tell you, that there's a crisis developing between the years of 2020 and 2030, then if I am intelligent and right, I've got to be able to lay down a case and start putting down evidences that everyone can look at, think about, look at the Bible and see if the Bible says so, and weigh the evidence and see if it's so. Does it make sense? We're beginning to lay down evidences, and right now, this is not biblical evidence. I'm looking at evidence from the world itself. Scientists in that first study looked at the population. They looked at resources like water and oil and other things and food. And they looked at this and came up with this. Now we're turning to another field of evidence. We're now turning to history, which is different than science. But guess what? History tells us the same thing. Now watch what this says. This says, historian Alfred McCoy explains why American power is coming to an end and lays out his vision for the new global order. Now, I want you to notice the year that this article was written. Can anybody see the year? The year of that is 2017. I had this, I was showing this before 2017. In 2017, in 20, uh, I was putting this article out talking about this. This is biblical. Now, my brothers and sisters, watch this for a moment. Now, watch what the prophet says. In the book Education, page 179 and 180, the prophet says, The present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority. What's the next two words? 
thinking men and women of how many classes? Now, interesting enough, notice what this uh, uh, article is called, this particular uh, uh, article is called, what is it called there? The big thing. Now, this prophet over 100 years ago told us that the thinking men and women will be thinking about this very thing. It says, thinking men and women of all classes have their attention fixed upon the events taking place all about us. They are watching the strain, restless ex- uh, relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of every what? In other words, everything on this earth would show us the same evidence. Every other earthly element, and they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place. Now, if we say about to take place, what do we mean by that? Far away or near at hand? So this says, not because a man has a Bible. That's not what this is talking about. It says the thinking man, they can just think and look at the nations, and look at history, and look at events, he will be able to look at the world around him, even without the Bible, looking at the world around him, he would recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place, and that not just America or Canada or some other nation, but that the world is on the verge of a what? Stupendous crisis. Now, do you know that the thinking men today, in every field of knowledge, night after night, we're going to put down more evidence. And we're going to look at this together, and we're going to find out, watch what this man says, this historian. Let's read it together. It says, the first paragraph says, the historian writes that what? All negative trends that are plaguing America now are likely to get much worse, growing rapidly by what year? Now, remember when the article was written. When was the article written? 2017. The historian says that it will grow rapidly by 2020 and will reach a critical mass no later than what year? Now, the other information was based on science. This historian is not talking about science. He's looking at the political landscape. He's looking at nation against nation, the restless conditions, and he looks at this and says, America as we know it cannot survive the 2030, and my brothers and sisters, 2024 is going to bring us to the door of the test. Do you know that the election year 2024 is showing us what is getting ready to happen in the United States of America? We have never seen a year in which everything is in an inflection point, a turning point on this year, 2024, as we move in to 2025. It's not accidental. Now, just as years before, just as years before, now, just as years before, I begin by the grace of God just using the Bible and history and prophecy to pinpoint that 2020 was going to be the beginning of the end. I want to tell you that we're on the stage of something else getting ready to take place. Not now, the beginning of the end. That's history now. We're going to go to something. I'm I'm going to coin a term for us today. If this is the beginning of the end, I'm going to put down 2020, 2024, and 2025. I'm going to put that as the middle of the end. Did you hear what I said? I'm going to put 2030 over here as the end of the end. Now, I'll just put plus or minus. You'll understand that later as we keep going in our study. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Do you know that right now we're entering into another defining point and something is getting ready to come to this country, to the world, deeper, worse than anything we've ever seen. And the world knows something is coming, but only the Bible gives a correct view of what's going to take place. Now, what you and I are going to have to do, because interesting enough, look what this man says. The American century proclaimed so triumphantly at the start of World War II. When was World War II? What year was that? When did it end? World War II. Now, you're going to find that that's very significant. We'll come back to that. 1945. May already be tattered and fading by what year? By 2025. And except for the finger finger pointing, could all be over by what? 2030. Now, what he's saying is history records that by 2025, it may not even make it to 2030. That by 2025, there will be such a critical political condition historically that the political scientists are afraid of what could happen in our country. And do you know that whatever happens in America, in the United States, spills over into America of Canada? We're going to prove this. Now, see, something happened. Now, now, does anybody know the date of last Friday? Yesterday. Anybody know the date of uh, Friday? April what? Not the 5th. I mean, I mean yesterday, not, not the week before Friday. I'm talking about yesterday. The 12th. Anybody know anything, anything, anything happened on the 12th anytime? Anybody know anything that ever happened on the, the 12th of April historically? Anybody know, know anything that happened historically on the 12th of April? I'm going to write down something on the board. 
We can see, look, in order to understand prophecy, we're going to have to start studying history. Now, my brothers and sisters, you're going to find out that on April 12th, in 1861, on April 12th, something took place known as the Civil War in the United States of America. Canada was heavily involved in that Civil War. Heavily involved. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're going to show you that now, now last Friday, a movie came out on the box office that was released and the world was looking at it. It got worldwide attention of what took place on April 12th. It was, they were showing it right here in the cinemas, even in Canada. That on April 12th, it was a movie. And guess what the movie is called? Guess what the movie is called? Civil War. The movie is called Civil War. And they made the release of the movie, particularly on April 12th and 2024, because the movie suggests that in America, we're going to see a second Civil War. Now, wouldn't it be interesting? I'm going to make a suggestion, and we're going to prove it later on. I'm not proving it tonight. We're going to prove it later on. But wouldn't it be interesting if the Bible teaches us that there's going to be a second civil war in the United States of America? And wouldn't it be interesting that that civil war could be sparked by the presidential election that takes place in this year? And I'm going to tell you something. What I'm telling you now, almost every historian is talking about it as I speak right now. And the ones that should know it the most we're saying nothing about it. You know that you should come to church and hear this, not just go to a hist history class and hear this. We should come to church and from the Bible recognize that we're not living in any ordinary time. My brothers and sisters, you cannot come casually to a meeting like this and think that this is ordinary. You have to understand this may be one of the last meetings that Barry uh, uh, Canada hears before this crisis takes place. It's not accidental. That God allowed this place to open back up, I promise you, we're getting ready to see something that we've never witnessed before. This is not a fairy tale. Now, my brothers and sisters, that movie was released April 12th. We're going to find out that the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy teaches us there will be a second civil war before the time of trouble, before the mark of the beast, before the Sunday law. We're going to see it before Jesus comes back again, and we're going to find that Canada is going to be sucked into it again like it was the first time. And my brothers and sisters, this is just before us. We found out, we found out in the midst of this, this says 2030, this is the end. This is 2014 now. This is a, 2014 from Huffington Post. Will it really be the end? Like the Doors were telling us back in the 70s. Anybody remember the Doors? The Doors was a rock group in the 1970s. I see in one hand. But we, 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 it's all right. We, we, don't do, we may not be listening to them now, but we know who they are. Amen. But the Doors, this rock group, they had a song called The End. It says, today we have enough, what's that next word? Data. We have enough data. Now, anybody know what data is? What do we mean by data? Evidence. Evidence information. Research. This is not something you're being thrown off the top of somebody's head. It says, today we have enough data about our ecosystems to make sound decisions that could potentially shift the needle slightly toward the better end. In a world where most of us do not have, what's that next word? Time to read studies explaining that 2030 is the year of a major shift in our planetary systems. Now, do you know that there, there are studies all over the, the internet? There are studies all over research articles and peer journals and reviews, scholarly studies on every field of knowledge telling us that 2030 is a time of a major shift politically, economically, socially, environmentally, on all fields of knowledge. But most of us have never even heard about it because we don't have time. We have time to watch the news. We have time to look at television. We have time to go to work. We have time, time to go to school. But we have no time to recognize the time in which we're living is telling us that time is running out. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says in a world where most of us do not have time to read studies explaining that 2030 is the year of a major shift in our planetary systems, we have to question ourselves as to what comes what next. It says for the past two year, 42 years, Donato Meadows, Jorgen Randers and Dennis Meadows spent their time explaining that 2030 was the expected year for the planetary system uh, a collapse in their book and study call, what is it called? The Limits to Growth. Not another dot-com bubble or financial crisis. No, a system collapse. Now, I want you to understand what it's saying. When it says not another dot-com dot, dot uh, uh, bubble, it's telling us, you know, in 2008, what did we see happen in 2008 historically? What happened in 2008? You know what happened? A financial crisis. 
2030, what they're telling us now is not going to be a financial crisis. It's going to be a system crisis, an entire, complete planet, planetary system crisis. In other words, everything that makes up the planet is going to give way. Finances, political society, economy, environment, everything that we call life, food, production, water, uh, uh, food, everything we call life is going to break down. Look what it says. Not another dot-com bubble or financial crisis. No, a system collapse. Not enough food to feed us all due to depleted, depleted soil. No more fish to catch due to ocean acidification and overfishing activities. Not enough drinkable water for all due to, uh, all due to pollution, climate change, and overpopulation. No more raw materials to keep the pace of our throughput-based industrial systems and so on. In other words, everything that we call life will begin to start breaking down. Now, what would happen to society if the whole system and fabric of life broke now? It would almost be like our present society would come to a grinding halt. Where will we get food? Right now, someone says, well, I'll go down to no frills. Guess what happens? You know, you ever have a hurricane before? You ever seen a hurricane before? What happens to the water on the shelf? No water. Do you remember COVID-19? Anybody remember COVID-19? What happened to the water and the food on those shelves? What happened to the toilet paper? I mean, you couldn't even get toilet paper. <laughs> now, my brothers and sisters, you've got to understand something. And do you know that when you saw that, you felt the crisis? Where's my food going to come from? Your food could be rationed. But do you know that something worse than COVID-19 is coming? And God has told us in the Word of God that we should do something about it so that we can be prepared when there's no means to buy and sell food. There's something we should be doing. We're going to get there. Now, my brothers and sisters, this tells us something, that all of this is just before us, right before our very eyes. We, had a, we have had enough signs of warning of a soon-to-come collapse of our what? Systems. Do you know that last year, it was the hottest we've ever seen that in the water, the coral reefs begin to die because the ocean water got so hot that it actually got hotter than a sauna. The water itself. Never before had that ever happened. Scientists got afraid because the coral reefs what coral reefs are to the ocean is like what trees or forests are to the, uh, uh, to the ecosystem. It is the, the very foundation, the breath of it. And when the coral reef dies, everything connected to it dies. And do you know that over 70% of all coral reefs died as, we, as of the last 10 years? All of them, over 75% dead right now today. There are places in the ocean where there's literally nothing. They call them dead spots. The, from the very smallest uh, 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 creature, all up the food chain, everything gone. And scientists are afraid of what this means. But do you know, brothers and sisters, we're going to show you that the Bible told us all of this was going to take place right before our very eyes. The Bible told us that we should watch this because all of this is like a coming jigsaw what? Puzzle. Now tonight, what we're going to have to do is put together just our puzzle. Now you remember there were three things that I said we needed in order to put this puzzle together. You remember what the three things were? Anybody remember what the three things were? Number one, we need the picture. Number two, we need the, we need the what? We need the, we need the edges. You can call it borders. It's the same thing. We need the borders. We need the limits. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're going to go through and we're going to start seeing this. And then we can start putting the pieces together and start seeing where everything fits. All of us are going to start making sense in just a little while. Once we get close enough, we'll be able to get to see the final piece. And when you get the final piece, do you know that you can look at a puzzle and you can know when it's almost finished? Am I right? You know, when you first look at a puzzle and you don't know what it is, if you didn't see the picture, you could look at the puzzle and you'll see colors, blue, green, whatever, but you wouldn't know what it was. But when you get more than halfway through, the picture begins to start forming. As we get through this week, right now today, you don't see the picture yet. I wish I could tell you all in one night. I'm a, look, I'm, I'm so excited about what's happening because, see, if we understand what this means, we will run to Jesus. Now, by God's grace, we're going to put this piece together piece by piece. What we're doing now for the next few nights, we're going to start dumping the pieces on the table. 2030 is a piece that's dumped on the table. 2020, a piece dumped on the table. 2025, a piece dumped on the table. What's happening with the elections? Pieces on the table. The environmental climate change, pieces on the table. We're going to come back and put all of this together. And you're going to see it fit together. But when we get to the end, you're not even going to need me to tell you. You want to be able to look at the picture and even a child can say the final piece goes right there. Now you can tell where you are in the end of the game because all the pieces have already been put together. 
We're going to show us that almost every piece has been put together. In the very last piece, we're going to see that mark of the beast, that passing of a national Sunday law. Now, this says coronavirus. What's the next two words? Radical change to life. Only one U.S. state has not reported a case. And, of course, everyone did, but this was at the beginning of the pandemic. What happened as a result of the pandemic? What happened? A radical change. People who never thought that they could stop going to church, stop going to church. Started watching church from pajamas, with your pajamas on. And then people had a hard time coming back to church. People still watching church from their pajamas. And there's a problem with that. God said, do not forsake the assemblies, the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is. We are supposed to be coming together more and more as we see the day approaching. A radical change took place. People who were going to school, you know that the parents had to start homeschooling their children. Am I right or wrong? Even parents that did not want to, they, they said, child, get away. But the pandemic said, no, you must homeschool them. The major universities let people off from universities like Harvard and Yale and Princeton and all around in Cambridge, all over. They started sending people home. Jobs began to start laying people off. People who said, I have no time to read my Bible. You had all the time in the world because your job laid you off. Radical changes were made. But isn't it a shame that we sometimes let life force us to make radical changes when love should make us make radical changes? We should not have to wait for another pandemic. You know that people right now are waiting to another crisis. Please, let's not wait until another crisis. Let's make it up in our mind tonight, no matter what happens, every night we're going to be here. Every night, it's going to take every night, I promise you, it's going to take every night. We, and really, normally, you know, we normally have a meeting. We normally, you know, when people bring me to a meeting, we normally don't even take Thursday off because so much needs to be studied. People try to study every night because they say, I, want, I don't want to miss nothing. They want to get every piece and put it together because they start looking and saying, this is not being made up. No minister is making this up. This is in the Bible. It's in history. It's in science. It's in every field of knowledge. We see the handwriting that is on the wall. My brothers and sisters, if ever there was a time to wake up, the time is now. I want to stop right here, and I want us to have a, a prayer as we get into the heart of our study. I think that it's time to understand this. What do you say? We cannot understand it without Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit to teach us like never before. Would you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer? Oh, Father in heaven. We're living in the most solemn time of all this world's history. Father, you are designing us so that we would not be surprised. You always send a warning before a crisis so that we would have opportunity to get ready. Before the flood, you sent Noah. Before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, you sent angels and then Lot. Before you came the first time, you sent John the Baptist. And Lord, before you came the second time, you send a message of three angels flying in the midst of heaven with the most wonderful message to prepare the world for the soon return of Jesus Christ. And Father, if we look at the signs of the times, if we look at the handwriting on the wall, it tells us that we are in the generation that shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Help us to stop playing games with God. Help us to stop putting recreation and, and amusement and television and jobs and work and school before you. Help us to put you first so that we have no other gods before thee. We want you to have first place in our life. And so, Father, tonight as we study, remove me. I'm fickle. I'm feeble. I'm fail. I'm ignorant. But you are strong. You are wise. You are mighty. Speak to me. Speak through me and speak to us that we might wake up before it is too late. Please abide with us now as we study, for we ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen. If you'll take your Bibles, we want to turn to the last book of the Bible. What book did I say? The last book of the Bible. That book of the Bible is called the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 7, we want to notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 7. We want to understand something very interesting in Revelation chapter 7. Revelation what? Revelation chapter 7. Now, my brothers and sisters, I believe that today that we're living in the most solemn and significant time of all the ages. 
I believe that we're living not at the beginning of time, but that we're living in the last days of this world's history. And God has given us evidence after evidence to show us that we're living in the time of a gathering storm. A crisis is developing all around us in every nation of this globe. We spoke of the crisis this morning developing in, in Russia and in China and in Asia and in America and in Canada and every part of this globe, a crisis developing. But yet, even though God gives a warning, many are not listening to that warning. In fact, do you know what this book is? Do you know what this picture is right there? What does this picture represent? This is the artist's rendition of what, what boat is this? The Titanic. How many have heard of the Titanic? Now, brothers and sisters, that Titanic, interesting enough, do you know when the Titanic sunk? Anybody know when the Titanic sunk? In April the 15th. That's tomorrow night. So now, my brothers and sisters, the Titanic sunk on April the 15th. Literally, almost a year to today, tomorrow, it will be a year, uh, it will be literally uh, 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 to the date of, uh, of the sinking of the Titanic. Now, brothers and sisters, when that Titanic hit the iceberg and began to sink, was it warned that that iceberg was in front of it, yes or no? It was warned. Now, how many warnings did the, 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 the Titanic got? Did the Titanic get? You know, the Titanic got six warnings. Six times. Iceberg ahead. Adjust your course. And Phillips, the man that was controlling the dial, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the supposed to get to communicate to the pilot's deck, he was so busy trying to catch up on messages, sending to this person and that person, sending this message across here and there, that he sometimes forgot to relay the warning message. But there were warning after warning that was given until finally it reached the pilot. But when he looked at it, they said, you know what? The Titanic is an unsinkable boat. It's amazing our confidence. Now, my brother and sister, I, I sing them a boat, but you know what happened. That by not listening to that warning, something happened and that Titanic sunk. You remember that, don't you? Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that when it sunk, they began to start singing in two hours. In, in, in two hours, that Titanic began sinking. And when it got further and further, there were those that recognized that they were in the final moments of their life. One man looking at this, he began to run and get scared, crying, God, God, save me. But you know, that, you know, in the Titanic, you have some of the richest people there in the Titanic. Do you know that, that, that to buy a ticket on the Titanic at that time, in the 1900s, it cost over $3,500, one-way ticket. Now, my brothers and sisters, today's money, that would be over $100,000. Can you imagine a man paying $100,000 to get on this boat, riding first class? He was comfortable, confident, you know, that they, 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 they employed the greatest jazz bands and worldly bands that they had to offer. And they had them playing all type of ragtime music and jazz music and rock music and, and worldly music. But do you know that the record says that when they got to the end, they stopped playing all that worldly music and they begin to start asking for a particular song for that band to play. You know what song they actually play? Nearer my God to thee. You know, when a man's getting ready to die, he don't want to hear that foolish rock and roll and that foolish rap and that foolish worldly music. When a man's about to die, he wants to hear the hymns of Jesus Christ. He said, nearer, my God, to thee. They wanted someone that was close and intimate and personal to save them. But for many of them, it was too late. But now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that for you and I tonight, it's not too late. God has literally been holding back time so that you and I can be ready before this crisis breaks upon the world. In fact, notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Are you there? Amen. Let's read verse 1 together. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1. What does the Bible say? It says, and after these things, I saw how many angels? Four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Verse 2 says, and I saw another angel ascending from the... Now, what direction did the second angel came from? This angel came from these. Now, four, get the picture, was standing on the four corners of the earth. But another angel came from the east, different from those four. And that angel from the east, notice what it says in verse 2. Revelation 7 and verse 2. It goes on to say in verse 2, it says, And I saw another angel ascended from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Verse 3, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God, where? In their foreheads. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want you to understand. That John, that, that right here in Revelation 7, John the Revelator saw our day in Bible prophecy. He saw the last generation. 
He saw the crisis that was getting ready to break upon this world under the figure or the symbol of a wind. Now, in Bible prophecy, winds represent strife, bloodshed, war, revolutions, times of trouble. Now, John the Revelator saw this time of trouble, but he saw that God sent an angel from the east to ask for those angels that were holding back that trouble to hold it back until an event takes place. Look at what it says. I want you to back up in verse 2. Look what he says. In verse 2 it says, That angel cried, in verse 2, with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. And he said, Hurt not the earth, verse 3, nor the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. In other words, the crisis was about to break, but God said, Hold it back until my people are sealed. Now I want you to understand something. If we get the seal, we're safe. If we don't get the seal, we're lost. So the only protection in the last days that the Bible pictures is the picture of a symbol of a living a seal being placed on the forehead. Now my question is, do you want that seal? I want that seal. Now my brothers and sisters, the Bible says that God is only authorized to seal a certain class. You know, the Bible doesn't say that in the last days God's going to seal seven and a half minutes. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says in Revelation 7 that the seal is going to be placed upon the servants of God. We're going to find out that a man can go to church and not get the seal. A man could be a seven Adventist, not get the seal. A man could be a, a Christian, so-called, a professed Christian in any denomination, never get the seal. There takes something specific to get that seal. And the devil doesn't want you and I to get that seal. And so the question is... How can I get that seal? Now, the angels tell us that they can only seal one class. It says, seal the servants of God in their foreheads. So the Bible teaches us who gets the seal, the servants of God. Now, my question is, are we all servants of God? What would identify us as servants of God? Go to the book of Romans. What did I say to the book of Romans? What book? We're going to Romans chapter 6, and I want you to understand. You and I, in order to be ready for this last crisis, must have that seal of God. If we get the seal, we're safe. If we don't get the seal, we're lost. And so Satan is trying to prevent us from getting the seal. And the Bible says that God is only authorized to seal the servants of God. And so my brothers and sisters, tonight we want to find out what will give us the ability to get this seal. What will give us the ability to get this seal? Look what it says in Romans chapter 6. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Beginning in verse 16, let's read that together. Romans 6 and verse 16. What does the Bible say? It says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. So the Bible says that we're only servants to whom we obey. In other words, if we obey the world, we're the servants of the world. If we obey Satan, we're the servants of Satan. If we obey self, we're the servants of self. But if we obey God, we are the servants of God. Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says that the only ones that are going to be sealed are not the servants of the world, not the servants of Satan, not the servants of self, but the servants of God. That means that unless we are obedient to God, we can never become his servant. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to ask a question. Has God given us something to help us to become obedient? What is the thing that we need to give God obedience? You know, there's only one thing we need to become obedient. Just one thing. It's love. The Bible says, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. That the power of love produces obedience. And so the Bible is telling us in these last days that God is looking for somebody that will love him so much that they're willing to obey every command God gives. And I'm going to tell us something. God has given us some commands in these last days. Commands on every aspect of life that if we learn to follow them, it would save us through Jesus Christ in this last hour. And this is why God says he wants us to receive this love so that if we love him, we'll be willing to obey what he says. Understand the time, know what to do, do what he says. We become God's friend. Now, my brothers and sisters, look what this says. It says the time of trouble is before us. The angels are, as it were, just loosening the four winds. Talking about what we read in Revelation 7. But they cannot loose them yet. Why not? The church is what? too far behind her privileges. The people of God are too indolent. Many are unfaithful. Many are unclean and polluted. We are not prepared for the crisis. The question is, how long will God wait for our 
tardy movements. Now, I want to ask you a question. Do you think that God is going to wait forever, yes or no? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that God said, hold up the winds of strife. Hold up until my servants are going to seal. But God is not going to hold those winds forever. And I'm telling you, in 2024, those winds are getting ready to be let loose. Now, how do I know? Look what the Bible says in the book of Luke. What book did I say? We're going to the gospel of Luke, the 21st chapter. What book did I say? We're going to Luke chapter 21. And notice what the Bible says, that God shows us that he's not going to hold these winds forever. God shows us in these last days, these winds are getting ready to be let loose. These winds are getting ready to come upon us. And God is showing us that the greatest thing that we can study as these winds are getting ready to be let loose is the real issue before our very eyes. In fact, in the book of Luke 21, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Luke chapter 21, notice what the Bible says in Luke 21, beginning in verse 25. In Luke chapter 21, beginning in 25, notice what the Bible says. It says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations how? With perplexity, the sea and the waves roar and men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be what? And then notice what it says in verse 27. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. The Bible says we're going to see a series of signs in the last days. They're going to take us to the second coming of Jesus. But then it says in verse 28, and verse 28, it says, And when these things, not in, but when these things, what? Begin to come to pass, then don't look down. The Bible says, then do what? Look up. And do what? Look up and lift up your heads. Why? For your redemption draweth nigh. Now, brothers and sisters, if we're going to get the seal, if we're going to become God's friend, in the last days, the greatest thing that we can study is the plan of redemption. Now, I want to, I want to make sure that this is zeroed in. In fact, I want you to write this down on your paper. The greatest thing that we can study is the what? Plan of redemption. Someone says, well, I thought we already understand that plan. We're going to find out that most of us have never really heard the plan of redemption. Someone says, well, I thought that's what we heard every day. We're going to study this in detail because my brothers and sisters, in order to be ready for the coming of the Lord, in order to get to know Christ as a friend, in order to be ready for the seal of God, in order to be ready for, to be ready for the crisis, we must understand the plan of redemption. Now, my brothers and sisters, notice what this tells us very clearly. This is the plan of redemption. Now, notice what this says here. What has God given us? I'm going to back that up. What has God given us to understand the plan of redemption? What has God given us? Do you know that without, that, 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 you know that, that, that there would never have been a need to write a Bible under divine inspiration if, plan, if the plan of redemption was not set in motion? Sin made it necessary for redemption to take place. And sin and redemption made it necessary for the Bible to be written so that you and I could understand that plan of redemption. In fact, go to 2 Timothy. We'll come back to Luke 21. We'll come back to this verse. But go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I want us to see this for ourselves. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, notice what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3. We know the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that he not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But in 2 Timothy 3, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In verse 15, let's read that together. The Bible says, and that from a, a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto what? Unto salvation. So the scripture, even a child can understand them. The Bible says that from a child, we can understand the scriptures which are able to make us wise unto salvation. So that plan of salvation, that plan of redemption is written down here in the scripture so that we can become wise to it. And so what God has given us to understand this plan of redemption is the word of God. And I'm going to tell you something. This is the book that Satan hates the most. Because if you understand that if you and I will get into this word, it will begin to start making everything, everything will begin to start making sense. In fact, we're going to find, brothers and sisters, that in the Bible, that plan of redemption comes out. And I want you to understand that the plan of redemption is the picture. The plan of redemption is the what? Now, remember what we said we're doing? We said that what we're going to do 
If we're going to put together the puzzle, the first thing we need is the what? What do we need? The picture. If you're putting together a sky or an ocean or a boat, you will need to look at the picture and then watch the puzzle come together. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're going to find that the puzzle piece, the pieces of the Bible we're putting together is nothing really but the what? The plan of redemption. That's the picture. Now, we're going to have to find something that that shows us what this picture looks like, and we'll see what we're putting together in the Bible. Now, watch what this says. We're going to find out this is the real issue. Now, watch what this says in the book Education, page 125. Let's read this together. It says, the central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other and the whole book clusters is the redemption plan. So the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation is designed to teach us the plan of redemption. Now, most people have never heard the plan of redemption as clearly as God wants us to understand. You say, what do I mean? I'm going to black this for a moment. I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. Do you know that most people today teach us that the plan of redemption ended at the cross in 31 AD? Am I right or wrong? How many have heard that when Jesus died on the cross, what was his last three words? You remember what the last three words of Jesus was? It is finished. And do you know that most denominations today teach that the plan of redemption ended at the cross of Calvary? Now, what we have to do is find out that in Luke 21, you remember what it said? Let's go back to Luke 21. In the book of Luke 21, we'll find out that if we think that the plan of redemption ended at the cross, it shows us that we don't really understand the plan of redemption. Because in Luke 21, Jesus now points to a time many years after the cross. He said there will be signs in the sun, signs in the moon, signs in the stars just before the coming of the Lord. And he said, look up when you see these things begin to come to pass. Then he said in Luke 21 and verse 28 and verse 28, he says, when these things begin to come to pass, look up. Why? For your redemption does what? Draweth nigh. Now in the last days, that tells us that redemption is still drawing nigh. What does nigh mean? It means close. So that means that redemption is still going on in the last days. So if redemption is still going on, it could not have closed. So that if it did not close at the cross, what did Jesus mean when he said it is finished? That's another piece of the puzzle that we're putting out. You see, we've got to understand the picture if we want to put all these pieces together. And then we'll understand exactly what all this means. Now, my brothers and sisters, this tells us, it says the central theme of the Bible the theme about whichever the, and the whole book clusters is the redemption plan. The restoration in the human soul of the image of God. Let's read this together. Let's read this together. From the first intimation of hope in the sentence pronounced in Eden to the last glorious promise of the revelation, they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. Revelation 22, 4. Now, when it says from the first intimation of hope, does anybody know what intimation means? The word intimation. Anybody know what that means? Intimation. That word intimation means a hint. In other words, it doesn't tell you exactly, but it gives you a, a suggestion. It's hinting at us. Now, it says from the first intimation of hope, does anybody know when the first time redemption was hinted at that there would be a redemption plan? Do you know, brothers and sisters, that when Adam and Eve sinned, they did not know that there was a plan of redemption? They ran, they hide, they hid from God's presence. They thought that they were lost forever. They did not know there was a redemption, the redemption plan. Even the angels had no idea of this at the beginning. At the beginning. The Bible says these are things that the angels desire to look into. Now, my brothers and sisters, does anybody know when the first hint that there was going to be a struggle, but the redemption plan was made available? Anybody know when the first hint was? In Genesis 3.15. In Genesis 3.15, it says, and I will put what? Enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. That was the first time that the serpent, Satan, heard about the intimation of hope. And he recognized that something was going to happen that would be enabled to cause a great controversy, a conflict that was going to end up in crushing his head. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says, from that first intimation of hope to the last glorious promise of revelation, they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. It says, the burden of what? Every book And every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of this wondrous thing. 
Man's uplifting, the power of God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He who grants this thought has before him an infinite field for study. He has the key. Now, when I ask you a question, did it say he will have the key or he has the key? Now, what does the key do? Now, if you had a key to a door, if I had a, a key to this church and I locked the door and I left, with, when I left with the key, you can come to the door, but you could not open the door. It would be locked up without the key. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that the Bible has been locked unless you have this key? We cannot understand the Bible without this key. And this is why God gave us the key so that we can study and understand everything that is written in principle from Genesis to Revelation. We'll understand the entire puzzle. Now, my brothers and sisters, the question is, what is this key? Because it says, he has the key that will unlock to him the whole treasure house of God's word from Genesis to Revelation. Now, my question is, what is this key that the prophet is telling us about? Because it says, it says he who grasps this thought has before him an infinite field for study, he has the key. So whoever got that thought has the key. So the question is, what thought is the key that will unlock to us the entire Bible? Now, I, I, I pause for a moment because I want you to, I thought you were going to thunder back to me. Here's the answer. <laughs> I was waiting for the class to thunder it back. Now, this, this tells me, now listen to me. We're in school. We're now going into a plan of redemption 101. We've got to understand this. This is what the entire Bible is about. You will never understand what 2030 means. You will never understand this crisis. You will never understand the pandemic, the beginning, unless we understand this. We're going to find out. In fact, go to Revelation 13. Let me show you something. Go to Revelation 13. Go to Revelation chapter 13. We'll come back. Go to Revelation 13. I want us to understand something. See, unless we get this, nothing else in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation will fully make sense. In Revelation 13 chapter, notice what the Bible says. In Revelation 13, it talks about the beast. He says, I saw one of his heads it was, as it was wounded to death. His deadly wound was healed and all of the world would wonder after the beast. In Revelation 13, notice what it says beginning in verse, uh, eight, uh, beginning in verse 17. Revelation 13 verse 17, are you there, amen? Let's read that together. It says, and that no man might do what? Buy or sell, save he that hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. The Bible tells us there's going to come a time when man will not be able to buy or sell unless he has the mark of the beast. But then the Bible says in verse 18, let's read verse 18 together. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, the Bible says, here is wisdom. Let him that hath what? Understanding count the number of the beast for it is the number of a man, and his number is what? Six hundred, three score, and six. In other words, his number is what? Six, six, six. Now, six, six, six is not the mark of the beast. That is the number of the beast, not the mark of the beast. He has a number, he has a name, he has a mark. Now, Revelation 13 says, not for everybody to count the beast or the name of the beast. Did you notice that? The Bible says in verse 18, here is wisdom, first part, here is wisdom. Let him that hath what? Let him that hath understanding, let him count the name of the beast. In other words, if we don't understand, we shouldn't count the name of the beast. If we don't understand, we should not even talk of the beast. If we don't understand, we shouldn't count to 666, we shouldn't even count to one. If we don't understand. So my brothers and sisters, God is trying to help us first. Before we can understand the crisis of the beast, his image, his mark, in the last days, we have to have some understanding first or it won't make sense what we're doing. So now the question, in fact, what we're studying tonight is something called, do you understand? What are we studying? Do you understand? That's my question. Do you understand? Because see, when you understand, we'll be able to put all this puzzle together. Here is wisdom. Let him that have, let him that have what? Understanding count the number of the beast. And my question is, do you understand? Now, we're going to find out that if we do not understand the plan of redemption, we don't understand. The plan of redemption is that which helps us to understand. Now, look at what this says. It says that the burden of every book and every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of what? This wondrous thing. 
What wondrous theme is being unfolded in every book of the Bible, in every passage of the Bible? What wondrous theme? What wondrous theme? The plan of redemption. Now, once we understand that, that whether we're reading Genesis or Daniel, whether we're reading Exodus or Revelation, that all of it is trying to explain the plan of redemption, then we have a key that can open up the entire Bible from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means then that what we need to understand the most is the plan of what? Redemption. We're going to find out that the beauty of the plan is going to reveal the beauty of the man. The beauty of the plan is going to reveal the beauty of the man. See, we must see the man, Christ Jesus, and by beholding him, we'll become changed. But we'll never see the beauty of the man, Jesus, unless we see the beauty of the plan that Jesus put together. This plan of redemption. And so, my brothers and sisters, the real issue is to understand this plan. So, the question is, what has God given us to understand the plan of redemption? What has he given us? He's given us the Bible. But he's given us something else in the Bible to actually make the plan of redemption come out of the Bible more clearly. In fact, when God wanted his people to understand the plan of redemption, he said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. In fact, go to Psalm 77. What book did I say? You're going to Psalm 77. Now, even without looking at this, you know that the burden of every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of this wondrous thing. So that means that every book in the Bible, every verse in the Bible is really trying to help us to understand the plan of redemption. So even before looking at Psalm 77, what really is Psalm 77 about? Talk to me, somebody. What really is it about? The plan of redemption. Genesis 3.15, plan of redemption. Revelation, plan of redemption. Every book of the Bible is trying to unfold this plan. Now look what the Bible says in Psalms 77. In Psalm 77, look at what the Bible says in Psalm 77, beginning in verse 13. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Psalm 77, let's read verse 13 together. What does the Bible say in verse 13? It says, thy way, O God, is where? Is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? When we want to see the greatness of God, the beauty of God, we've got to get in that sanctuary. It doesn't say outside the sanctuary. It says, thy will, God, is in the sanctuary. Now, look what this says now. Look what this says concerning this sanctuary. This takes us from Genesis to Revelation, from Eden being lost in Genesis 3 to Eden restored in Revelation 12. Now, this shows us something very interesting taking place right before our very eyes. Look what this says here. This says, all who have received the light upon these subjects are to bear testimony of the great truths which God has committed to them. Let's read this in, together. It says, the sanctuary where? In heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf of man. It concerns every soul living upon the earth. It opens. What is opening this? The sanctuary opens to view the plan of redemption, bringing us down to the very... Now, I want you to understand this. That means that if I study the sanctuary and the plan of redemption, it should bring me down to the very what? Close of time. So in order to understand the close of time, I've got to understand the plan of redemption that is made plain inside the sanctuary. Does it make sense? So if we're living in the last days at the close of time, I will never understand it unless I understand the picture. And the picture is the plan of redemption. That's what all the pieces of the Bible is trying to fit together. From Genesis to Revelation, every book, every burden, every, every passage, everything is trying to unfold this wondrous theme. And when we understand this plan, it will make sense why there's an election getting ready to take place in 2024 and what it's all leading to. See, we cannot understand that unless we first understand this. Here is wisdom. Let him that have understanding count the number of the beast. So we first got to understand. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. What way is in the sanctuary? Look at verse 15. Psalm 77, 15. Look what it says in verse 15. It says, thou hast with thine arm, what's the next word? Redeem thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. So the Bible says, thy way is in the sanctuary. What way? Verse 15 says, the way of redemption is in that sanctuary. So if I want to understand the way of redemption, I've got to get back into that sanctuary. And the devil, if he doesn't want me to understand anything, he does not want me to understand this way of redemption. Now I want to ask you a question. When I say way, what do I mean by way? If I said to you, 
I want you to follow me and I will show you the way back to my house or the way back to my hotel. What do I mean when I say the way? What am I talking about when I say the way? The path or the directions. So when the Bible says, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, the Bible is showing us that the directions of redemption is in the sanctuary. If you want to know how God is going to redeem us, how we're going to get this relationship with God, how the end of time is going to take place, the directions of how all of this is going to happen is inside that sanctuary. And so if there's something that the devil does not want us to understand, it's this sanctuary. Because when we understand the sanctuary, everything in the Bible from Genesis to the Revelation begins to start making sense. In fact, go to Psalm 73. What did I say? We're going to Psalm 73. We'll back up just a few chapters. In Psalm 73, notice what the Bible says in Psalm 73, beginning in verse 16. In Psalm 73, verse 16, the psalmist says these words in verse 16. And verse 16, it says, in Psalm 73, verse 16, it says, When I thought to know this, it was what? Too painful for me. The psalmist was talking about looking at the world. You go back in Psalm 73 and read earlier, he's talking about the wicked. It looks, he said, it looks like the wicked are prospering while the righteous are suffering. Have you ever noticed that when you accept Jesus, you think every day is going to be sweeter than the day before. It's going to be peaches and cream. And then you accept Jesus and you don't see the peach or the cream. And so in your mind, you say, what happened? But my brothers and sisters, when you accept Jesus, it means that a battle is going to take place, a great controversy, because Satan does not want us to be saved. And he knoweth that he have but a short time. But God is telling us, don't worry about that. He says, if you keep your eyes on me, if you put your hand in my hand, I'm going to bring you to a place where it's not going to be so painful. You're going to understand everything. In fact, look what it says in verse 16. It says, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me, but not forever. Verse 17 says, it was only painful until, until what, Psalmist? Verse 17 says, read that with me. It says, until I went where? Into the sanctuary of God. What's the next two words says? Then understood. Now I'm going to stop you right there. Then what? So where is the place of understanding? Not out of the sanctuary, but what? The Bible says, I, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood. So the question is, do you what? Understand. Remember, Revelation says, here is wisdom. Let him that hath what? Understanding. Well, where is the place to go to really understand what's happening in that book of Revelation? Where's the place to go? Inside that sanctuary. Now look what it says. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then what? understood I there what in I want to tell you something we're going to find out that we will be confused on every subject until we get into the sanctuary do you know that this is why there's so much confusion in many churches today that this is why there's a confusion called Babylon the Babylon the church Babylon is confused because it does not understand and what it does not understand is the plan of redemption that reveals Christ from Genesis to Revelation and this is what we need to become the friend of God. And the devil has confused the popular churches by not going into that sanctuary. And God has given to the remnant church an understanding of the sanctuary on October 22nd, 1844, so that we could understand what's taking place in the world, in the Bible, and get ready for what's about to take place as an overwhelming surprise. Do you know, brothers and sisters, if you want to understand what is it that we should be doing right now, we've got to get into the sanctuary of God. The only confusion is when we're not inside that sanctuary. And so, tonight, we're not going to finish tonight, we're laying an introduction. Tonight, we just want to, before we get ready to close, we want to make a brief, uh, a crash course study. You know what a crash course is, don't you? Not so you'll crash in the ground, but to actually give you a quick study of what's about to, what you're about to understand. We don't have time to go into a whole week's study of this, but I want to give us a foundation of what that sanctuary is. Question, how many places does the Bible teach us are connected to the sanctuary? We're going to find out that the Bible teaches us that in the sanctuary, there's connected to the sanctuary three places. How many places? Three places. You're going to find out that three places take us from Eden lost all the way to Eden restored. We're going to find out what the three places are. Number one, the first place is the outer court. Second place is the holy place. And the third place is the most holy place. Would you say that with me? Three places. How many places does the sanctuary have? How many places? Three, three places. What are the three places? Number one, out of court. Number two, holy place. Number three, all right, we're in class now. I'm going to come to this side. I want you to tell me the three places. What are the three places in this, in this side? Out of court, 
I can't hear you. Holy place with us. Most holy place. That sounds good. Even, the, even a young man can understand this. All right, we'll come to this section. What are the three places? What are the three places? Tell me. What are the three places? Out of court. What else? Holy place. What else? Most holy place. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If we can only understand these three places, we'll understand the final generation. We'll understand the close of time. All that stuff we talk about with 2030 and the history is going to make perfect sense when we understand this. This is the picture. We're dumping pieces on the puzzle, but once you get the picture, then you're going to start putting together the puzzle and you'll be going to start saying, ah, that goes there. That makes sense there. I understand that there. But the place of understanding this, we've got to get into the sanctuary. Crash course. We're getting a, a brief summary. The sanctuary has how many places? Three places. Where are three places? Out of court, holy place. All right, now I'm going to give you a closed book test now. This is an open book. This is a closed book. Now, I remember when you were in school and they said, you're going to have a closed book test. You say, oh, no. When you have an open book test, you say, praise God. What is the first place connected to the sanctuary? Can somebody give me the first place? Young man. Out of court. Praise God. Somebody give me the second place. Holy place. Somebody give me the third place. Most holy place. All right. Now, that's not enough, though. I'm going to start you here. Is this terminology that seven Adventists have made up, or is this Bible terminology? The idea of out of court, holy place, most holy place. Who made this up? Was that the word of God? Someone says the word of God. Now, my next question is, where in the Bible could we find an out of court? What does the Bible speak of an out of court? Because, see, everything we believe should be in the Bible. Amen? Everything we believe in the Bible. The Bible is built on explaining the paradigm. The greatest book in the universe is the Word of God. So now, where do we find the outer court? Someone says, where do we find the outer court? Can anybody tell me? All right, tell me. Where next this? What verse says outer court in, in Exodus 25? What verse says outer court? Let's go to Ezekiel. Let's go to Ezekiel. I, I want to make it very simple. Now, you're right. In Exodus, you won't, you, won't see it in, uh, you won't see it in 25, but in Exodus, it does speak of a courtyard, which was outside of the sanctuary, which in fact is not a court. But I like things very simple. You like them simple? I don't know about you. My mind is just simple. I, I like things very simple where the Bible is very clear in explaining what it says. Now, notice what the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 10. And when you go there, please write this down so that you know there are three places. Out of court, holy place, most holy place. Please take notes. When you get this, we need this. Every night we're going to be building on what we studied the night before. We're going to be building night after night so that we can understand that 2024 is no ordinary year. And it takes this to understand that. Now, look what it says. In Ezekiel chapter 10, we're putting the puzzle together. In Ezekiel chapter 10, notice what the Bible says. In Ezekiel 10, beginning in verse 4. Are you there, amen? Now, before we even read the verse, you remember that the burden of every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of what plan? The plan of redemption. So we know it's about the plan of redemption already. But look what the Bible says in Ezekiel 10 and verse 4. Let's read that together. Verse 4. What does the Bible say in verse 4? It says, then the glory of the Lord went up from the... Now, I want you to understand something. When you talk about cherub, that's sanctuary language. In the most holy place, they were covering cherubs. But then it goes on to say, uh, 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 it says, a cherub that and stood over the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud. And the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. Verse 5. Let's read verse 5 together. And the sound of the cherubim's wings were heard. Where? Even to the... I can't hear you. Even to the... So does the Bible speak of an outer court? Yes or no? In plain language, the Bible says outer court. And so write it down, you know. So the Bible, number one, the first place that we must understand and connected to the sanctuary is that there is something called an out of court. What is the second place connected to the sanctuary? What's the second place? Holy place. Now, my brothers and sisters, does the Bible speak of a holy place? Where does the Bible speak of a holy place? Now, wait a minute. Now, you can't tell me, yes, it speaks of a holy place and then get quiet on me. You see, everything we believe should be right there in that word of God. Where does the Bible speak of a holy place? It speaks of an Exodus, speaks of Hebrew. Where can we go in Exodus? Where can we go in Exodus to see a holy place? Where can we go in Exodus? Let's go to Exodus chapter 26. Exodus chapter 26. Notice what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 26. In Exodus chapter 26, 
The Bible is very clear about this. In Exodus 26, the Bible tells us not only is there an outer court, but the Bible says there is a holy place. Notice what the Bible says in Exodus 26, beginning in verse 30, uh, beginning in verse 33. Exodus 26, verse 33. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In verse 33, the Bible says, And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatches, that thou mayest bring in what? Thither within the veil, the ark of the testimony, and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the what? So does the Bible speak of a holy place, yes or no? Where do we find a holy place in the Bible? Exodus 26, verse 33. All right. Third place, most holy place. Does the Bible speak of a most holy place? Where? Same verse. Praise God. I'm making sure you're together. I got to make sure you're awake with me. Now, so the Bible then speaks of an outer court, a holy place, most holy place, in type, showing us something very from Scripture, showing us these three places. Now, do you know that this three places takes us, these three places takes us from the beginning of God's work to the end of his work. It says, it says here, the intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. By his death, he did what? He began that work, which after his resurrection, he ascended to complete or finish in heaven. We must by faith enter within the veil, whether the forerunners for us entered. There, the light from the cross of Calvary is reflected. There, we may gain a clear insight into the mysteries of redemption. We'll find that the work of Christ began in the outer court, the work of redemption, but the work of redemption finishes in the most holy place. It starts in the outer court, outside of the sanctuary, ends in the most holy place, inside the sanctuary. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Now you will understand that in the Bible, Jesus is likened to two things. Even though there are three places, Jesus is given two symbols. He's called Alpha and Omega. Now what does Alpha mean? Beginning. What does Omega mean? This takes us from beginning to end. It takes us from Genesis all the way to the book of uh, Revelation. This is the plan of redemption spanning the entire history of the world. We see Jesus as a lamb and we see Jesus also as a priest. Now, my brothers and sisters, this takes us through the sanctuary. Who was the lamb of God? Write down in your notes, John 1, You remember that John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, behold, the lamb of God. Jesus was the lamb of God. You remember that in the sanctuary, in the book of Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, it says that Jesus is our great high priest. Jesus is both lamb and priest. Now, my brothers and sisters, Jesus as lamb and Jesus as priest, but all of it is about Jesus. We're going to find that the beauty of the plan reveals the beauty of the man. Now, as, as lamb, he's alpha. As priest, he is what? Omega. So that means if we're going to understand Jesus from beginning to end, from Alpha to Omega, from beginning to end, we've got to go through the sanctuary and understand Jesus in both of these compartments. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're going to find out that when you understand this, it's going to put all of this into perspective. It's going to make sense. God is going to show us something very clearly. Now, look what this says now. Can the plan of redemption go on forever? Yes or no? Is there a limit to the plan of redemption? Now, my brothers and sisters, we're going to find that there is a limit to the plan of redemption. In fact, the Bible says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. So if we're going to understand the end, we go into that plan. Look at Jeremiah chapter 5. What book did I say? Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 5. Heavenly Father, as we get ready to bring our message to a close tonight, help us to see that inside this sanctuary, you are making plain your plan of redemption. So that we can understand the real issue and that we can understand that we're living in the last moments of this earth's history. And if ever there was a time to get ready, the time is now. Please bless us as we look at these last few minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jeremiah chapter 5, we're going to look for the last few minutes to put, bring this message to a close. Look at Jeremiah chapter 5, and I want us to notice something. I want us to know that inside the sanctuary, God has given us the ability to see that you and I are approaching a limit. That we're approaching a what? We're going to see that the plan of redemption could not go on forever. We're going to see that there is a limit to this plan. Could someone help me quickly? 
I'm going to need somebody to put some strong legs on these. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Thank you, young man. Would you help him, please? I'm going to tell you something. The devil doesn't want us to see this. He's afraid of what's about to happen. This is just night one, and God is trying to explain this to us. As we get ready to look at these final points, it's the last leg. You've got to twist it so that it gets strong. That, that, that last leg in the end, you've got to twist it like that. Um, the, the back, the back, the, it's, it's, it's this last leg here. If you, if you twist the last leg, thank you. Let's go to Jeremiah 5. What are they doing there? Go to Jeremiah 5 quickly. Go to Jeremiah, the fifth chapter. What book did I say? You're going to Jeremiah chapter 5, and notice what it says. Heavenly Father, we see that the enemy is not happy with what we're studying tonight. We pray, Lord, that as we look at these last few minutes, that you'll remove every distraction, that you'll help us to focus on the subject at hand, that we can see clearly that time is running out. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at Jeremiah 5. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 5. And I want us to see what the Bible says in Jeremiah 5, beginning in verse 22. Jeremiah 5, beginning in verse 22. Are you there? Amen. Jeremiah 5. Let's read this together. What does the Bible say in Jeremiah 5, beginning in verse 22? What does the Bible say? It says, fear ye not what? Me, saith the Lord. Now, is everybody at Jeremiah 5? I want you, everybody should be looking at their own Bibles. Let's look at Jeremiah 5, verse 22. It says, fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble where? At my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a what? Perpetual decree that it what? Can not pass. Now, it's very important that you see this from your Bible. In Jeremiah 5, make sure that you see it from your Bible. It says in Jeremiah 5, in verse 22, it says that God has placed something. We're going to find that in nature, God reveals something about himself. God reveals his character in nature. The Bible says the heavens, the earth, they declare the glory of God. Now, we're going to find that nature shows us that God has placed a bound by a decree. And what is a bound based on this text? It says in Jeremiah 5, he has placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that what? That what? What does the text say? That it what? It cannot pass. So the Bible says that the bound is something that we cannot what? That we cannot pass. And so the sand is that bound. You know that no matter how much the waves come onto the earth, the waves come onto this sand and they pass up, but it's sudden, sudden, to some point it comes to a place where it says this far and no further. The sand stops it. In fact, the Bible goes on to say, it says, and though the waves... Thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot do what? They cannot pass over it. So the Bible is telling us that in nature, God has bounds that cannot be passed. He has what? Bounds that cannot be passed. Now watch what this says. Now time is almost finished. I'm reading down the line. And what we have been years learning, they will have to learn in a what? Few months. They will also have much to unlearn and much to learn again. Those who would not receive the mark of the beast and his image when the decree goes forth must have the decision now to say, nay, we will not regard the institution of the beast. Now, for the prophet to say that what others have taken years to learn, we will have to learn in a, in a few what? In a few months. We're going to find out that there's something about time that we must understand. There's something about time that we must understand, and that is that there is a limit. In fact, the prophet says, a sin-hating God calls upon those who profess to keep his law to depart from all iniquity. Neglect to repent and obey his word will bring as serious consequences upon God's people today as did the same sin upon ancient Israel. Let's read the first four words together. There is a limit. Let's say it together. There is a limit. One more time. There is a limit. Don't be afraid to say it. One more time. There is a limit. Now, there's a limit beyond which, which he will no longer delay his judgments. Now, God, he's been holding back the winds of strife for a long time. But there comes a point where God will no longer delay the winds of strife. He will have to let them go. 
And the Bible says, we're going to find that, that word bow, and the prophet says, there is a limit. In fact, again and again, the prophet uses that phrase, there is a limit, there is a limit, there is a limit. It says, the flames that consume the cities of the plain shed their warning light down even to our time. Now, what city of the plain was destroyed by a flame? Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, brethren and sisters, you better understand that the same sins that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for are in the world today, right now. And if God does not bring a limit to the world, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, we are taught the fearful and solemn lesson that while God's mercy bears long with the transgressor, is God long-suffering? Is God merciful? Is God patient? But guess what? There's still a limit. It says, there is a limit beyond which men may not go on in sin. When that limit is reached, then the offers of mercy are withdrawn and the ministration of judgment does what? Begins. So inspiration tells us that there is a limit. There is a limit. Question, does, does nations have a limit? Does every nation of the world have a limit? Yes or no? Go to the book of Acts. What book did I say? You're going to Acts 17. And we want to notice in the Bible that the Bible teaches us that every nation has a limit. In Acts 17, we're going to close on this point. Now, notice what it says in Acts 17. In Acts 17, notice what the Bible says in Acts 17, beginning in verse 24. God is explaining the plan of redemption, unfolding the principle behind every verse of the Bible. The jigsaw puzzle being put together. The Bible says in Acts 17, beginning in verse 24. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Acts 17, look at what it says. In fact, let's back up to verse 23. 23 says, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription. What was the inscription? To the unknown God. In other words, they didn't know who God was. They didn't know God close and intimately and personal. It says, Whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Paul says, I want you to get to know God. And then Paul begins to start talking about time. Because there's a relationship between time and getting to know God. In fact, you will find that one of the reasons why they didn't know God was because of how they were using their time. In fact, look back to verse 22. In verse 22, Acts 17, 22, it says, Then Paul stood, uh, verse 21, excuse me, 21. It says, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there, what does the next word say? Spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear what? So new thing. In other words, they were wasting time. And as a result, God was to them unknown. In order to know God, we must take advantage of time because in order to get to know God, it takes time. Then the Bible goes on to say in verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with what? Now I want you to understand something. In this verse here today, the Bible is telling us something about the world itself. We know that's the subject matter for in verse 24, the first part says, God that made what? What did God make? What did God make? I'm going to put these two words on the board. God that made the world. So whatever God's talking about, he's going to tell me something about the world itself. Now, how many nations does that take in? How many nations? Does it take in Canada? Does it take in America? All of that is a part of this. Now, in Acts 17, look at what the Bible says in verse 26. And have made of how much? One blood, all nations of men, for to dwell on the face of what? Of the earth. So God is telling us about the world. He doesn't change his subject. He said all nations. In other words, he's given us another name, another way of explaining the world. You can say that the world is nothing more than what? All nations. Remember when the Bible says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world for a witness unto all nations. So all nations is just another way of saying the world. So the Bible is telling us something about the world, telling us about every nation of that world. And God tells us two things about the world. What two things does he tell us about the world? Number one, it says in verse 26, and have determined the what? The times before appointed. So the Bible is telling us that God, who made the world, the first thing that the Bible is telling us about the world is that God determined something about the world before it was even made. 
What was the first thing that God determined about the world? Now, what does the word determine mean? What does the word determine mean? If I said I'm going to determine to do something, it means I made up my mind. Am I right? So now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us that God determined, selected, made up something about the world. What two things did he do to the world? Number one, he determined the time before appointed. Is that in the Bible, yes or no? We read that in verse 26. The time before appointed. What was the second thing that he did to the world? He determined two things about the world in this verse. First, he determined the time before appointed for the world. What's the second thing he determined about the world in this verse? What's the second thing? And the bounds, verse 26 says, and the bounds of their what? Habitation. So the first thing God determined about about the world is the time. The second thing he determined about the world and all nations is their bounds. Now my question, what does it mean if you will put those things together, what did God decide about the world if you put those two things together? He He determined a time bound. A time what? Now question, what is a bound? Is the bound only speaking geographically? In other words, you have a place where Canada ends and where United States starts. You call that a a line, the, the, the state line, and that's the border. Am I right? So is the boundary or border only talking geographical or is it talking about a time boundary? Now, how do we know? Because see, that word bounds means something very specific. Go to Job chapter 14. What book did I say? We're going to Job 14. Look at Job 14. We want to find out that this word time bound means something. God says that for all nations, for the world, he has determined the time before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That God has set up a time bound for the world. What is a bound? Is it only a geographical boundary line or a border? What does God mean? Well, the Bible explains itself. It's a wonderful thing when you don't have to make anything up. All we have to do is let the Bible explain itself. Line upon line, text upon text, here a little and there a little. Notice what the Bible says in the book of, in the book of where we, Job chapter 14. What book did I say? In Job 14, notice what the Bible says. Job 14, beginning in verse 5. Let's read this together. Remember, God determined this about the world. What is this bound? Job 14 and verse 5. Are you there? Amen. Let's read verse 5 together. It says, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his what? Now, what type of boundary is it talking about? It said the number of his what? The number of his what? Look, what look, look at the text. Let's look at the text. The Bible says in verse 5, seeing that the, 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 the number of his months are with thee, thou hast appointed his bounds. Is God dealing only with geography or is he dealing with time? He's dealing with time. And so when God set up a time bound for the world, there is a bound or a time. And what does that bound mean? Look at what it says. In verse 5, verse 5 says, and has appointed his bounds, that what? That what? That he cannot pass. That's that same word here. This bound is something that you cannot pass. So a time bound is a time that what? What is a time bound? It is a what? Time that we cannot pass. Now I want you to think about this now. That means that the world has a time bound or a time limit that cannot be passed. Do you understand? Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that everything this says, watch this now, this is, a, this is what we call a limit. In other words, the Bible is telling us that for the world, there is a time limit. Look what it says. Christ Object Lessons 177. The exact words the prophet says, the world has become bold in transgression of God's law. Because of his long forbearance, men have trampled upon his authority. They have strengthened one another in oppression and cruelty toward his heritage, saying, How doth God know, and is there knowledge in the Most High? That's Psalm 73. Question, is there knowledge in the Most High? Yes or, yes or no? How much knowledge? All knowledge is in the Most High. He's omniscient. Now, you know, in that, in, that, in that chapter of Psalm 73, it tells us, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I there what? In. It says, Although God has had long forbearance, it says, but there is a line beyond which they cannot pass. Does the Bible say the same thing? Yes or no? We found the exact words in the scripture that God has set up a limit. They cannot pass. In fact, it says the time is near when they will have reached the, what's the next two words? 
prescribed limit. Now, I want to ask you a question. What does prescribe mean? The word scribe. What does the word scribe mean? A scribe means written. What does pre mean? Before. So a prescribed limit means that God wrote the limit down, wrote it down before the limit was ever reached. I wonder where he wrote the limit. In the word of God. He prescribed it down. It says, even now they have almost exceeded the bounds of the long suffering of God, the limits of his grace, the limits of his mercy. Now, what happens when man reaches the limit? Does God sit back and do nothing or does he get up? It says, when we reach the limit, the Lord will do what? Interpose to vindicate his own honor. What does interpose mean? That means that God steps in. Now, my brothers and sisters, what we have to find out is, does we know there is a limit because the Bible says so, the prophet says so. The question is, does the Bible tell us that we can know when that limit is reached? Does the Bible tell us we can know what that limit is? Yes or no? You know that the Bible tells us that we can know when that limit is reached. Let's close in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, those who know what the Bible says in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, we're going to close there. We're going to show that the Bible says not only is there a limit, not only that we can know that God wrote that limit down, but God has made it possible through the study of the Bible that we can understand when that limit would be reached. Look what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 24. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Matthew 24, you remember the question. This study from Jesus came from that memorial question in verse 3. In verse 3, let's read this together. In verse 3 it says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came into him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And what else? Of the, of the end of the world. And Jesus began to show them how to know. Now notice what he says in verse 32. He talked about the pandemic. He talked about the disease. He talked about the environmental devastation. But then in verse 32, notice what the Bible says. In verse 32 it says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branches yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is not far away. You know it's what? Nigh. What does nigh mean? Near. Verse 33, so likewise ye, when you shall, what's the next word? See all these things, know that it is near. How near? Even at the doors. Now, I want, you to, I want to ask you a question. Did God say this was going to be visible or invisible? How do we know? He says, when you shall. So God is telling us there are going to be some things that we can see. That will let us know that his coming is near. How near? Even at the at the doors. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to be at the door? Someone said that's pretty near. That's very, very, very near. Am I right? But you know, the Bible is very specific when it says at the door. It means something very specific. In fact, in the next verse, it explains. In the next verse, in verse 34, how does verse 34 start? What's the first word of verse 34? Verily. Now, the, the word verily. Does verily change subjects? No. Verily means surely of a certainty of a truth. Do you remember when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus? And Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus tried to play intelligent. He got smart. And he said, can a man go back up into his mother's womb after he's been born? And Jesus didn't waste any time. Jesus was a straight preacher. Jesus looked at that man who had a master's of, uh, of divinity, uh, uh, so-called at that time. He was a master in Israel. And he said to him, unless verily, verily I say unto you, except you are born of the water and of the spirit, you cannot see nor enter the kingdom of God. Did Jesus change his subject? What Jesus did was went more emphatic into his subject. In other words, he said, if you do not understand me, Nicodemus, let me make it plain. So verily make something plainer when you use that word verily. So in Matthew 24, when he said, we should see certain things and when we saw them, we can know that the coming of the Lord and the end of time was near. How near? Even at the door. Well, what do you mean by that? Is there a wooden door up in heaven that we're looking for? What do you mean by the door? Jesus said, verily. In other words, if you don't understand what it means to be at the door, let me make it plain to you what it means to be at the door. In verse 34, it says, verily, I say unto you, what's the next two words? This generation shall not pass. Now, I want to see if you are studying with me. What does it mean when it says this generation shall not pass? What type of generation would that be? 
Now look at the look, look now, look, 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 we study something. We saw that Jesus said that he made a bound. A bound is something that what? We cannot what? Pass. And so a time bound is a time limit that you cannot pass. Am I right? Then Jesus was asked about the end. And Jesus said, I'm going to tell you about the end. I'm going to give you signs. When you see these signs, know that my coming is near. How near? Even at the door. And then he says, verily, to understand this. This generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Question, what generation is this? This is the bound generation. This is the limit generation. This is the last generation. This is the final generation that will be alive in order to see the coming of the Lord. So the Bible is saying that while we may not know the day or the hour right now before probation closes, we can know the final generation that's going to be alive to see the coming of the Lord. And that generation is the generation that's going to reach the limit. And the question is, are you and I in that generation tonight? Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you by the grace of God, we're going to show you with unsh without a shadow of a doubt this week that the generation that we're in right now in 2024, that this generation shall not pass, that if something does not uh, uh, cause our life to reach an untimely end, some accident, that we will be alive to see the coming of the Lord. It will happen in this generation. We're going to prove it by the grace of God. And now my brothers and sisters, Jesus said we should be able to know that and see that and we're going to find out where do you think we need to go in order to find out what that limit generation is. In order to find out that generation at the end of the world, where do you need to know, think, think that we need to go in order to find out who that generation is? Thy way, O God, is in the... In order to find the end generation, the limit generation, the last generation, we've got to go into that sanctuary. We're going to find out that in the sanctuary, God shows us exactly who he is. And it's interesting. I wonder, when we go into that sanctuary, is it going to take us to show us something about this date right here? I wonder if it's going to be able to explain to us when we find out what that generation is, what that means. Because see, when we go through this, we're going to see that, that whenever you reach a limit in the Bible, in the Bible, there is a number that's always associated to a limit. Guess what that number is? Seven. From Genesis chapter 1, when God started time, God used a number that's an ordinal number, and an ordinal number means that it's a number in which all heaven works on. Now, for a computer, there's something called a binary code that the entire computer system works off of two numbers. Anybody know what the two numbers are for the binary code for the computer? Zero and one. And everything on that computer works off of the system of zero and one, zero and one, and many different orders. And if you get zero one, you can understand the entire code of that binary system. Well, God does not have a binary system. We're going to find out that God has a urinary system, a una system. What is, what, what is uh, when you're talking about un system, we're talking about uno means what? It means one. We're going to find out that God has an uno system in which everything in the universe works off of one number. And guess what the number is? Seven. And when God started the creation on day one and day two, do you remember what happened in Genesis 2? Anybody remember Genesis 2? Let's go to Genesis 2 as we close. Go to Genesis 2. Go to Genesis 2. We're going to find out that in Genesis 2, something happened in Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, we see this number seven comes on. God created the world day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. But in Genesis chapter two, the Bible says that God did something. We're going to explain this has something to do with the plan of redemption. In Genesis chapter two, notice what the Bible says in verse seven. Let's read that together. The Bible says in, verse, in Genesis two, verse one, Genesis two, verse one, it says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And all the host of them, verse 2, and on the seventh day, God, what? We're going to find out when God ends anything, he always ends everything on seven. So he, if he had a church at the end of time, he would name it something about the seventh. This is why God has rose up a seventh heaven in his church. When God has a generation at the end of time, it's something about seven. You'll notice in Revelation, the whole book of Revelation is built on the number seven. How many candlesticks? Seven. How many churches? Seven. How many uh, 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 lamps? Seven. How many plagues? 
Seven. How many trumpets? Seven. How many seals? Seven. In each case, seven, seven, seven is always not the first. It's always the last. Now, my brothers and sisters, it will be interesting to note when we start going through this, and we won't finish now. We're going to close right here, but I want you to see this. World population, this is 2011, will reach what? Seven billion. Did it reach seven billion, yes or no? It reached seven billion in 2011? Now, do you know that the last time the world reached seven billion, you know what happened when the world reached seven billion, the last time the world reached seven billion? Do you know the world had reached seven billion before? There was only one other time in history when the world reached seven billion. Anybody know what that time was? A child is born, the world population hits seven billion. It says it here. World population is seven billion. It said global population is expected to reach eight billion in 2025. It reached it just a little bit earlier before 2025 and eight billion. But watch this now. Something happened. Here's no preaching. Look what this says. Seven billion people. Do you know that the last time the world had seven billion people was just before the flood the first time? And once the world reached this number, the world came to an end. Now, where are we today? The world before the flood. Here, creation scientists have gone through the Bible, looked at how long people lived, did some calculations, and they was able to look at the lifespan. And you know, the flood came in the 1656, the 1,656 years after the world was created, the flood took place, according to the Bible. They put all these numbers together and the statistics, they were able to find out how many people died before the, uh, in, the, uh, in the flood of Noah's day. The figure arrived at would be around what? Seven billion people. And so my brothers and sisters, the last time the world reached seven billion people, the limit was reached and a flood came. Now today, we have eight billion people on the planet. Do you know that when the world reached 7 billion, it showed us we were in the generation. By the time the world reached the 7 billion, it showed us that we were in the generation that should not pass until all these things be what? Fulfilled. Now, my brother and sister, look at this now. The handwriting is where? On the wall. We see it. World population reached 7 billion signs of the days of Noah. It's all over here that it reached this. But now the world, brothers and sisters, is here. Population explosion, world reached 7 billion. Climate change, limit was reached, and then the world came to an end. And all of this is an example of what's going to happen right now today. And this says, planet has only until what? 2030 to stem catastrophic what? Climate change. Now I want to ask you a question. I'm going to close right here. Wouldn't it be interesting to find out what if the Bible were to tell us that God is going to finish everything in this world in 7,000 years? 6,000 on earth, 1,000 in heaven, and wouldn't it be interesting if the end of the 6,000 years lines up with the science and with the history and with every field of knowledge showing us that the limit of all things at hand, wouldn't that be interesting? We're going to ready to study and see from the grace of God, and I want to give you some homework so you'll be ahead of the schedule. And I couldn't be a good teacher if I didn't give you homework. I know that you want some homework, so I'm going to give you some. Homework. Leviticus chapter 23. What book did I say? Please read Leviticus 23. It takes us in Leviticus 23 through seven feasts of the sanctuary because God builds everything on the number what? Seven. Please Try to get familiar with those seven feasts, Leviticus 23, and I want you to read a chapter in Great Controversy, a chapter in Great Controversy called uh, page 398. What page? Great Controversy, page 398, all the way until 401. That's just a few pages. Now, if you read that, you're going to be ahead of the class, and you're going to begin to start seeing the pieces are going to start coming together. It's going to start making sense. There's a reason why the climate is not working the way it is now. There's a reason why it looks like there's a drought all over the world. There's a reason why it looks like fires and hurricanes, tornadoes, and it has something to do with what we're saying now. We're going to go through this, and all the pieces are going to start fitting together. We're going to see that right now, that even as I speak, another pandemic is going to come that is even going to wipe out a few more people, not just thousands. We're going to see something worse than what we saw before. You know, the last pandemic wiped out millions, am I right? But we read, excuse me, we read of something called a golden what? Billion. 
Can you imagine? Billions of people wiped from this planet. And we're going to show you that the Bible tells us all of these things are going to take place and tells us when and how and tells us what we need to do so that we can get ready. I don't know about you, but I want to get ready. What do you say? Homework is Leviticus chapter what? 23. 23. Great Controversy page what? 398 to 401. It's talking about prophecy fulfilled. If you read those pages in that chapter, you'll be ahead of the class and all this stuff is going to begin to start making sense. You're going to begin to start saying, I see, Lord, if ever there was a time to get ready, the time is now. Now, brothers and sisters, there's someone that says, Lord, I've been given the world time, but now I want to give you my time. If there's someone here tonight that says, Lord, I want to start over and I want to give you my time tonight so I can become your friend, would you just stand with me as we get ready to close tonight? And by standing, you're saying, Lord, I want to take a stand with you tonight that I want to give my heart to you afresh, my life to you afresh, so that my time is now given to Jesus. You know, this week, we're going to have the opportunity to give Jesus our time. Today, we've given him time. You could have been anywhere else in the world. You could have been anywhere else in Barrie. You could have been anywhere else in Canada, but you chose to be here tonight. And do you know that when you give God your time, God gives you his friendship. In order to become God's friend, it takes time. Are you going to give him your time this week? Yes or no? Praise God. Praise the Lord. Let's pray as we close tonight. Heavenly Father, we're standing tonight, Lord, because we want to stand and can, and, and, and as a symbol that we want to stand with you in these last days. We want to give you our heart afresh. We want to be revived tonight. Father, we see there is a limit. And Lord, in this generation, we're going to reach that limit. This generation shall not pass. And Lord, we want to be ready to meet you. We pray, Lord, that you would help us from this night forward to give you our time. Thank you for helping us to start tonight. We could have been anywhere, but we chose to give you our time tonight. Thank you, Lord, for we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a silent moment of meditation. Amen. Are you happy you're here tonight? Did you learn anything tonight? Do you want some more? Tomorrow night, we're going to pick up here. What time should you be here tomorrow night? What time? Now, I'm going to adjust the time. Please be here tomorrow night at least at 6.59. What time? We're going to see, brothers and sisters, that each night, we're going to adjust the time just a little bit more and give you one more minute. We need to get here on time. We need all the time we can so that we can study on time, get you out on time, so we can get ready. Very soon, man is going to wish that he had all the time in the world, but time will then be too late. But tonight, time is not too late. What do you say? Amen. Amen. Uh, right? We're going to have a closing, we're going to have our, our, our closing revival song as we get ready to leave. A closing song? Just, the theme song? Just our theme song as we get ready to close. Our theme song, please. Satan will do everything he can to keep you from coming back tomorrow. It's going to get harder every night because every night we're going to be building. Every night we're going to be climbing in a stair ladder, a staircase going higher and higher. You must make it up in your mind tonight. Nothing is going to stop you from being every night. 
And we're going to see that if we'll give God every night, there will be some radical changes that happen in our lives that brings us into that relationship with Jesus. Amen? Amen. I'm going to be praying for you. Please pray for me. I'll be praying for you, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. What time? Ah, don't tell me 7 o'clock. 6.59. Praise the Lord. May God bless you. You may consider yourself dismissed.